This is Sci Cafe. So before I get started, I want to actually talk a little bit about science versus just talking about crocodiles. So one of the things that that I think is uh, really important is science communication and is sharing with people sort of how people get involved in science. Because I think that a lot of people feel like they can't participate in science these days. A lot of people feel like there are scientists and non-scientists. And so I, I'll get to the crocodiles, I promise. But one of the things that I really want to express is that for me, um, I had a really unorthodox beginning uh, to my career. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that first. So first of all, what are scientists? So a lot of you probably like to dance, but you might not get paid to dance, but that doesn't mean you can't participate in dancing. And a lot of you can probably drive, and you don't get paid to drive, but that doesn't mean you can't participate in driving. And so I have the perspective that there are some people who get paid to do science, and there are a lot of people who can participate in science without getting paid for it. And I think that we're all born with the ability to do science. The very first experiment anyone ever does is dump their Cheerios or their milk or whatever on the floor and test gravity. So we all start out with it, and where does it go? What happens? Why do people stop questioning the world around them? And I think one of the things that happens is a lot of people get told, well, it's just the way it is, or because I said so, or don't ask questions, I'm busy. And I think it drives that inquiry-based thinking out of a lot of people's lives. And then they start feeling like that's something other people do. And the one thing that I had that a lot of people don't have is I had a mom who never once did that to me in my entire life. So this is Fossil, Oregon. This is population 200. It's in the middle of northeastern Oregon. And it's in the middle, it turns out, it's in the middle of the John Day fossil beds, which is how it got its name. And those are actually kids taking their sheep to go get ice cream at the mercantile. And this is not an old photo. This is like now. <laughs> so this is, I was born right outside of this town. And what's really cool is I had no idea at the time that I would end up um, working in an institution that actually houses some of the most incredible fossils from the John Day fossil beds in the world. So one day I was looking in a drawer and it said John Day fossil beds. I'm like, how did that happen? It wasn't fate. My mom sent off my portfolio when I was in high school to art school because she wanted to get me out of the town that I was in. And I got into art school because I guess I was a decent artist and I hated it. Uh, <laughs> but I loved art history, which is great. So I decided to sort of stick with art history. This is all gonna come in later. And while I was doing my art history undergraduate degree, I took a course called the History of Evolutionary Theory. And that course changed my life partly because of the topic and partly because of the woman who taught it. And I'll never forget her name. Her name was Mildred Dykeman. She's an amazing teacher. And she was this very challenging person and she um, helped me explore and understand how to figure out the relationships among living things on planet Earth. And one of the, really things, the things that I was really interested in was the relationships of humans to their relatives. And I wanted to understand why certain organisms have conflicts and other organisms don't. And so I thought if we could understand the history of the relationship, the social behavior of, of primates, that might help us understand why people fight with each other. Because I just want to, like, maybe if we can understand it, we could stop it. I don't know, I was young, naive. And so the very first thing I decided I wanted to do was get DNA from Neanderthals. And everyone said, that's never gonna happen. The next thing I did was I said, well, maybe if I study primitive primates, I will be able to understand how social behavior evolved. And so lemurs in Madagascar, you've all heard of lemurs, I'm sure, they have these female-dominated social systems for the most part. And they resolve conflicts, in some cases, by having stink fights and with their little glands on their wrists. And they have all kinds of interesting social behaviors. But they're really, they're, uh, matrilineally dominated social groups. And I was like, well, this might be the key. I'm gonna to go to Madagascar and study why lemurs have you know, females in charge. And uh, maybe they have something that we can learn from about social conflict. So um, I went to McGill University on an exchange program in Canada. And there's this crazy other story of how I did that. It was basically because I was mad at a boyfriend. I didn't even know where Canada was or McGill or Montreal or anything. 
But I ended up working at the Red Path Museum in, in Montreal for a while, where I fell in love with museums. So I decided to go to graduate school and uh, to go off to Madagascar to study red rough lemurs. We all know where Madagascar is, I hope, at this point. There's this big giant continent over here, and then there's this island over here, Madagascar. And I went to Madagascar and did this epic trek across northern Madagascar, only to discover that uh, everywhere I went, people had eaten the lemur populations that I wanted to study. And so I had no dissertation project. And I honestly can't blame the people in northern Madagascar. These are entire families living on a bowl of rice a day. So, you know, that's a whole other conservation story, and we can talk about that as well. But I came back with no project, and um, luckily I had uh, graduate advisors here at the Natural History Museum. He, he basically gave me the choice of two bags. Bag number one, bag number two. There's this cute thing over there. I'm not much of a cat person. Can anyone guess what I chose? <laughs> Crocodiles. And the reason I chose crocodiles is actually because when I was in Madagascar studying the lemurs, I had actually noticed that there were really interesting human social norms surrounding crocodiles. And one of those was that uh, people worshipped crocodiles in a lot of places, and another was that um, people had been feeding crocodiles in certain lakes for like a thousand years. Some people thought that the crocodiles were their ancestors. So crocodiles were really sacred there. And they lived in volcanic cores. Um, they lived in some really interesting places. They live in caves where they just eat shrimp. And I had heard that they were actually originally described as a separate species, Crocodilus madagascarensis. And nobody in this room needs to realize what all this means other than to say that these are all the different things that just the Nile crocodile has been named throughout its history. But Crocodilus madagascarensis is one of those things. So I was like, I'm going to go to Madagascar and I'm going to figure out whether or not these are actually a separate species. Most people don't realize that by the 1970s, all the crocodilians, that includes not just the true crocodiles, not the alligators, there's all these other species in this group were on the verge of extinction. They, we had wiped almost all of them out. Um, we had used them for boots and luggage. We had persecuted them because they were a threat to livestock, and in some cases, people. People were scared of them. They just wanted them gone. We had converted lots of areas from wetlands into uh, housing. And so crocodiles were one of the first case studies of sustainable use of a wildlife product in order to bring it back. So what they did was they had communities that had crocodiles around them get into agreements where they would harvest some of the crocodile eggs and they would raise those hatchlings up and they would sell the products either as meat or as leather in order to make it worthwhile for people to live near this animal that was potentially a dangerous, threatening animal to them or their livestock. And the reason this could actually work is that crocodilians, for the most part, they'll have really large numbers of eggs in their clutches. So in anywhere from like 40 to 60, and usually about 10% of the eggs actually hatch, and maybe 1% makes it to adulthood. So the natural offtake from populations is pretty extreme, and so they thought this would be a good way to bring crocodiles back and have some sort of benefit for the communities. And the tricky part about this, well, I should go back for a second. The tricky part about this is fads happen, so what if the market falls out of crocodile products, right? What if nobody wants to buy crocodile products anymore? That could be a problem. They wouldn't be worth anything. All these communities would have all these crocodiles. So then they might decide they're going to harvest all the crocodiles right away to try and get some money, or something like that. So there are some potential disincentives in there. Um, but the other big issue is monitoring crocodile trade, because crocodiles are one of these groups that it's almost impossible to tell crocodiles apart unless you're a specialist. Most people have trouble telling an alligator from a crocodile. That's the number one question I get, and some of you might actually wonder. Um, alligators and crocodiles are really not very, well, they're closely related, but they're very distantly close, closely related. So way in the past, they split off about 60 million years ago. I don't study alligators at all. I only study crocodiles, and crocodiles are kind of babies relative to alligators. Alligators are really, really old. Um, but anyway, it's really hard to tell them apart. And uh, there are very few people, maybe, I don't know, 30 people in the world that could look at a crocodile, 
uh, and tell what species it is just at a glance. And certainly when they're products, like skins and things, they're really hard to tell apart. And so I wanted to develop a genetic monitoring system so we could see if there are different, uh, if we could monitor the trade and see where products were coming from, because that would make this whole process more sustainable. You don't do science in a vacuum. So I was thinking, how on earth am I going to do this project? So I reached out to a lot, a lot, a lot of people, because there was certainly no way that I could travel around the globe collecting samples of crocodiles to understand crocodiles' genetic relationships. So I enlisted a lot of people to send me samples, but the other thing is, because I had worked in museum collections, I knew that there were all these specimens in collections. And so this right here is an egg from this institution, the American Museum of Natural History, that was collected in 1930. And if you can see the label, it actually says Crocodilus madagascarensis. So I knew that there were all these treasures stored in these institutions that could be used to answer this question. So I didn't necessarily have to go travel the world to get the samples. But the other thing, because of my bizarre background, was that I also knew that there were crocodile specimens in anthropological collections and in art history collections. I knew that there were crocodile mummies. And so when I needed to fill in gaps in my study, I was like, well, Maybe I could get DNA from crocodile mummies. And nobody told me I couldn't. At that point, I had never met somebody who said, oh, there's no way that's ever going to happen. This is a crocodile hatchling that was mummified by the ancient Egyptians about 2,000 years ago. I was able to take little tiny samples from the tails of crocodiles that were mummified and actually get really good DNA from them. So when you work on this stuff, you have to work in what's called an ancient DNA room. And this was before next generation sequencing, which I'm, I'm going to talk about in just a minute. You have to be really clean and really careful. And we just sort of were really lucky. I was able to get DNA. These are little bands of DNA, just pretty picture I like to share with everybody. This is the old way of getting DNA. Now we do it in a, in a different way. So what did we find? This crazy surprise, right? All of a sudden... We had data, genetic data, that actually showed that the Nile crocodiles were two completely separate groups. So on the left, you have white dots, and on the right, you have red dots. Those were genetically completely different. And I was like, what's going on? I must have screwed up. I'm an art history major. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I, I redid everything a lot of times. Um, and working with other collaborators, we were able to extend our study to include all the species of crocodiles, not just the Nile crocodiles. This is a picture of most of the true crocodiles, the living true crocodiles, genus Crocodilus. And at the top, you have the New World crocodiles. There are four species in the Caribbean. We had what we thought was one species in Africa, and then we have all these Asian species, the Siamese crocodile, the mugger crocodile, the saltwater crocodile, all these other species. And you see right there, there's this little red box that says Crocodile Melodicus 5 and 6. Those were from Western Africa, and they were not as closely related to the other Nile crocodiles as were the ones from the Caribbean. And when we see this in science, it means that they can't be the same species. There's no way they could be the same species. So we published this paper. The other cool thing was that the relationship between the Nile crocodiles and the Caribbean crocodiles, the New World crocodiles, we dated the timing of that divergence between those species, and it was really, really recent. So it had to have taken place when the Atlantic Ocean was in its current position, so three to six million years ago, which meant that they had crossed the Atlantic Ocean. And it seemed crazy at the time, but then we realized uh, the natural history of crocodilians is such that they can store sperm, they cannot eat for 10 months, and actually these routes across the, uh, the Atlantic were ones where um, people used to ride those uh, trade winds to get from, from Africa to North America. So it wasn't that far-fetched to think that, but you're wondering about the mummies, I'm sure. Don't be scared. This is just a diagram showing branching relationships of all the samples. And what we have on the right is the, all the eastern samples, the Nile Nile crocodile. And on the left, we have all these western samples of this thing that was completely different. And the light gray patches in it were all crocodile mummies. And so all of the mummies fit into that light gray patch, the western group. So we knew whatever those mummies were was this other species. The other really interesting thing we found out was that 
if you looked at just the modern samples, the ones on the left, you had this big split. But if you looked in the museum collections, up to 1922, they actually both co-occurred in the Nile, which meant that we're actually losing the Western one really recently. It had been previously um, more broadly distributed. So what do you do when you find a new species? A lot of people have no idea how this works, right? It's always in the movies, people name things after themselves. This is bad, you would never, ever, ever do that. That's really tacky. <laughs> what you do is you do what's due diligence. You do all the research to see, well, who named this before? Is there any chance anyone did? Did anyone ever describe it way back in history? So now you're gonna ask me, what did Napoleon have to do with this? Napoleon, decided to go on an expedition to Egypt, as some of you know, because we have an obelisk in the park. He took with him a whole bunch of scientists. And the reason he wanted to take scientists with him was because he wanted to find out what the resources there were. He also just wanted stuff. So this guy, Geoffrey St. Hilaire, was a, an anatomist at the Paris Museum of Natural History, and he went on this expedition with Napoleon. And he was really interested, I love this story, this guy's one of my heroes. He thought if he looked at mummies, he would be able to see change over time in populations of animals. So he actually believed if you looked at a mummy, you could actually see a difference uh, at, over a couple thousand years. And this is near and dear to my heart, as you will see soon enough. But so he had gone and, and collected uh, all these mummies in Africa, in Egypt, when uh, Geoffrey St. Hilaire got back to the Paris Museum of Natural History, he started going through all this material, all the mummies, and he found this little mummy skull, and this is a picture of the actual skull with India ink writing on it from the expedition, and Geoffrey St. Hilaire thought this was, looked different. He described this as a separate species, Crocodilus sucus, and the reason he chose that name, it was for the sacred crocodile, the god Sobek, uh, that the ancient Egyptians recognized. And he actually used the even more ancient literature, Herodotus and other things, and used anecdotal evidence to describe this species uh, based on behavioral things. It was considered more tame, it was small, it was kept in temples, and the Egyptians actually recognized this as different from the Nile crocodiles. And this is the paper he wrote, the two crocodiles existing in the Nile, and he describes this thing as Crocodilus sucus in here, based on this mummy. And there's even earlier little notes that talk about this, this tiny other crocodile in the Nile. So we went with Geoffrey St. Hilaire's description, and we just re-described this as Crocodilus sucus. So we rediscovered it, and we published this a few years ago. So Crocodilus sucus, that's the, that's the tiny skull. It had actually been missing. They found it while I was doing this research. Um, and the really cool thing is that now we're working with people who have mummy collections and we're trying to find out if we can confirm whether or not all of the individuals that they mummified were actually this one species and not the other. So people from the Brooklyn Museum were here recently with some of their mummies and we were using the CT scanner here. And one of the things we think we can do now is we can go back into the collections and use, now that we've used the DNA to re-identify all these individuals, we can go back and do all these measurements of their skulls to be able to try to figure out if we can characterize them based on their skull shape. I like, you can actually see in that, you can see the, the India ink writing that was on the sticks because it had some sort of metallic compound in it. All right, the other really cool thing about this is that the Nile crocodiles uh, that are here in the museum and the dioramas, these are the original archival photos that they took for the Upper Nile group that's in the Akeley Hall. This is that diorama. And if you see in the back right there, we'll do a little pop-up. The guy in the back is a painting. This guy in the front is actually a taxidermied crocodile. And so we have DNA from these and we can show that this is actually the species that we redescribed. And this brings me to my other great passion, which is the dioramas here. Um, I'm gonna get back to the crocodiles, don't worry. So I have this project I keep trying to find a home for. It's called DNA from Dioramas. Because if you, if you don't know 
I'll tell you, all of the dioramas in the Akeley Hall of African Mammals are real places. They actually real, really existed, and they may still exist, depending on the conditions there. But all of the individual animals in those dioramas, their uh, skeletons are in the collections here. So this institution holds thousands and thousands and thousands of museum, uh, museum specimens. And so we can use the DNA from, we don't have to go into the diorama and mess with the art in the diorama. We can go into the collections and get DNA and see what's changed over the last hundred years since these were done and, and look at change, uh, global change in wildlife populations over time. And we're actually doing this with leopards and it's working really well, it's exciting. So get back to the crocodiles, sorry. So this whole project got me thinking about why some animals are sacred. Why are some animals sacred? You know, is it because people just really like them? Well, I noticed when I was studying crocodiles that crocodiles have this incredible ability to heal themselves. So you, f you find these crocodiles that have these horrible wounds, these giant like missing limb, gaping wounds, bites, they have, they're in these cesspools of nasty gook, and they're fine. And it's like, how do they do that? Like what is the magic ability to resist these pathogens in the environment? Well, I wasn't the only one who thought that. So if you go back and look at all these medieval curiosity cabinets and things, and because I was an art student, I looked at these paintings a lot when I was working on my crocodile project, um, you see all these pictures with crocodiles on the ceilings. And we're gonna play this game called Spot the Crocodile. <laughs> oh, Spot the Crocodile. That one looks a little bit like an iguana. Oh, Spot the Crocodile. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> So what's going on with this? People believed that crocodiles had some ability to, to heal. They had some healing property. They didn't know what it was necessarily, but now people are starting to research it. So a few years ago, some people in Asia started to look at um, what's going on in the blood plasma of Siamese crocodiles. And if some of you have been here in the exhibit, uh, the crocs exhibit, um, they actually have some Siamese crocodiles here at the museum right now during the croc exhibit. And Siamese crocodiles are critically endangered. They're on the verge of extinction. And this was the species that they first found that they have this incredible, their blood plasma has unbelievable uh, antimicrobial uh, properties. So they tested it against all kinds of staphylococcus and, and, and um, strep and all these other infections. And they found that in a, at least in an um, experimental design, it was almost as effective as, as any modern antibiotic. Now, what I don't want anyone to do is go out and start draining the blood from crocodiles <laughs> to fight their infections. But what we do know now is that we almost lost, in the 1970s, this incredible reservoir of genomic knowledge of how to fight infections. But now we can do studies on it. We can research what is it in the genome of crocodilians, crocodiles, that actually allows them to have this, this incredible uh, resistance to pathogens. And um, a couple years ago, people sequenced the genomes of three crocodilians, uh, the alligator, the uh, saltwater crocodile, and the one of the, uh, the gavial, which is one of the long slender snouted crocodiles. And they were able to find that uh, the, the immune system in crocodilians is in triplicate. So their major histocompatibility complex is in triplicate. It's a really, really interesting difference from um, other organisms. Let's get back to Madagascar just for a minute. So the other thing that I discovered when I was going through the collections in museums is that there's this mysterious crocodile in Madagascar besides the Nile crocodile. It's called, it was originally called Crocodilus robustus and the Malagasy horned crocodile. And this is a skull, it's on display here at the museum and there are about 13 specimens here at the museum. And the really weird thing about this thing is it was alive and well in Madagascar until humans got there about 2,000 years ago. And also, 
Nile crocodiles got there about 2,000 years ago. So this is a great forensic story. It's a forensic mystery. So what happened to these? Did they die out on their own mysteriously at the same time that people and Nile crocodiles got to Madagascar? What happened? In the collections, we also have some really interesting clues. So this is a picture of one of the skulls here in the paleontology department, and it has this hole, you can see where the string is, that may, may be a wound from something like a spear. It doesn't fit a crocodile tooth, we know that. So that's a curious thing about it. The other question is whether or not the Nile crocodiles and this thing coexisted at the same time. So there's this very early report, this guy, uh, um, Humboldt, he traveled to the center of Madagascar and found these crocodiles and he brought back bones to the people who described this extinct crocodile. And they said, oh yeah, this is this extinct, extinct crocodile. And he said, yeah, well, but it's still living there. And so now what we want to do is use DNA to actually tell what this thing actually was. Was it a true crocodile? Because if it was a true crocodile, genus Crocodilus, then it's possible that it could have hybridized with the Nile crocodile uh, and could have been lost through genetic swamping or maybe the ghost of its DNA is still there. We don't exactly know. And so we just, after three years of trying, we just got data, DNA from this thing. We use this new approach, uh, it's called sequence capture, where you use little bits of DNA as like fishing lures to pull DNA sequences out of uh, extinct specimens. They've used this on mammoths, they've used this on, used, used this on ancient horses, and they've used it on Neanderthals. It kind of irks me, because that was my idea many years ago, before we were able to actually amplify DNA. Um, anyway, so we just got the data, and I'm not allowed to tell you about it, because it's really exciting. <laughs> But so stay tuned. We'll keep you posted. We're just our preliminary data are really interesting. It's a little too soon to share with you what this thing is, but it's really, really exciting. And it's another one of those things like, you know, the mysteries in the drawers in this museum are never ending. It's really, really exciting stuff. So I don't have a lot else to say except for one thing I do want to point out is you know, I said earlier, I didn't choose the cats. I chose the crocodiles. I'm not a big cat person, but I'm always an underdog person. <laughs> and so that's Rosalind Franklin, who was the co-discoverer of DNA. That's Geoffrey St. Hilaire. And this is actually Raymond Dart, who discovered Australopithecus, and no one believed him either. So don't let people tell you it can't be done. Don't do it, it's not worth trying. And a lot of the best science that was ever done in the history of humanity was done by farmers and gardeners and people who were not labeled scientists. And with that, I will let you guys ask questions. So, thank you.